we've been having all of these leaks come out. And during this period, we've seen them bring out the, the Red Scare. Oh, you know, Russia is doing this and, and Russia has done that. All of this is to divert from the actual issues that the leaks reveal. But that's just sort of like their play to kind of like muddy the water a little bit so people really can't focus on what's most important. You, you know how you have a, a math problem where they say stuff like, you know, there's a bunny across the street and there are five mailboxes. And, you know, the slope of this is 50 degrees. And then I want, I want you to tell me, you know, how many mailboxes are on this street? It's like, I mean, I'm, I mean, uh, how many bunnies are across the street? And it's like, the answer is one. But it's just like, why did you give all of this other information that was completely not relevant to what the question was? Anybody remember those problems? I hated those problems because they give you a long paragraph and really only one sentence out of this paragraph was necessary to answer that question at the bottom, but you had to read this whole thing just in case it asked you questions that had to do with something else in there that was completely unrelated. But that's what I feel like they're doing with these scare tactics about Russia. I feel like they're, it almost feels as though they're just trying to put a lot of stuff out there so that it's really hard to have a coherent analysis on, on the actual information. So, Specifically about the about uh, the leaks, we see now that there are a lot of things that people in government and our government in general at the state level, at the local level, and at the federal level are doing that a lot of times we're just unaware of because, you know, a lot of that stuff can be classified. Some of the stuff is happening behind closed doors and it's not open. And so when people complain about that, and then you turn to the punditry and the punditry tells you something like, well, people don't deserve a trend. People don't need to know everything that the government does. They just need for it to be effective. And when you hear that, you know, as a matter of course, it does make sense. You don't need to know every single thing that the government does, right? You know, not every single mechanism. However, you also don't need the government to be able to make decisions beyond public purview and there's no real recourse for the public to take if they don't like those decisions that individuals and government made. When you have a system like that, it, it just breeds corruption. And, and what I mean by that is you can have a few individuals with a large amount of money or a large amount of access, whatever you want to call it, however you see it, come in and they can get things from the government, get special rules, negate regulations, you know, get settlements instead of without having to, without having to admit fault and just pay a fine and then have the fine later reduced and then write the fine off on their taxes. That's the kind of rules that they have put in place behind closed doors that nobody pays attention to. And most of that is because there's not enough transparency in how the government functions. I think oftentimes when we try to get transparency or let's say a whistleblower comes and, and blows the lid on all that nonsense and we find out exactly what the government has been doing, then it's a huge media campaign to downplay what happened, to, to make up some excuse, to make you believe that somehow transparency stands in the way of effective government. When the that couldn't be furthest from the truth. The truth is, the most effective governance is going to be a transparent one. Now, I'm not saying you have to have, you know, national security people, you know, our agents abroad, informants and things of that nature, you know, our military plans, all that stuff doesn't have to be, you know, fully open to the public. However, a, you know, State Department meetings, what people she met with, I think that that's... I think that's a fair game argument to say we should we should know who these people are meeting with. And in general, you know, we should be able to ferret out, you know, maybe possibly what they were talking about. You know, what kind of policy changes were, were enacted after this meeting? You know, why did they even have this meeting? I think that that's a fair, perfectly fair question. If I meet with someone and I'm an elected official, trust me, if that person is any type of person requesting something from me, as an elected official, you better believe I would want it to be a transparent interaction. Therefore, I mean, 
that way no one can question what kind of decisions I made when the meeting was fully in the open and you know the transcripts are out there you can see what was discussed whatever else there may be that way everybody is is well aware and if somebody wanted to practice oversight they could that's i mean truth be told you know democracy is about citizen oversight but when you have the ability to subvert that and to go around that process and the whole like secret meetings and and you know decide things behind closed doors without public oversight, you know, you're really, you're really subverting democracy. You're really trying to get around democracy. And you can say it's for efficiency purposes. And, you know, sometimes efficiency is good. But I don't think that that decision had to have been made in a week. You know, it, it may not have even been something very important. It's not something that requires that we sacrifice citizen oversight for efficiency. In fact, there are very few things that I think citizen oversight should not take precedence over. Very, very few things.